We got a great text for you today. It comes out of the portion of scripture that many of you already know, a lot of you are familiar with. I want you to draw your attention to it because I'm telling you, this is amazing stuff. Absolutely phenomenal. I love this graphic that, uh, <laughs> that was put in here with the Beatitudes. Nice. Um, but that's what we're going to be looking at. So let's draw our attention to Matthew 5, verses 1 to 16. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them the Beatitudes. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Wow. Mm -mm. That is... Oh, well, we got some bonus. That's good. You can read those. That's true too. There's no question. Let's do some praying. Oh, Lord God Almighty, you are an awesome and holy God. And we thank you so very much for this opportunity we have to be here together. To recognize the wonder of your presence. To be ones who are attentive to your word and willing to embrace your instruction. So even now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon our hearts be made acceptable in your sight, for you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I got something special for you. You guys might want to turn the volume up a little bit on this. 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engine go on. Sideways shaking was unbelievable. The vibration was so intense you couldn't see the instrument panel. I thought we'd had it uh, during the launch. I was hoping that Frank Borman didn't have his hand on the abort controller. He, he said he took his hand off. He'd rather die than make a false abort. One minute after liftoff, the Saturn V is already supersonic. Well, the Saturn V is still the most powerful machine that man has ever devised. 20 tons of fuel a second, seven and a half million pounds of thrust. I think we were all surprised at how strong that thing was. <laughs> it had had two or three iffy missions before ours, but it was a piece of cake. It just worked beautifully. Unbelievable. In the first stage, blast the Saturn V to seven times the speed of sound. The second stage cut in. Big bang. At 40 miles high, it's still accelerating. When you staged, you were thrown forward in the belts and then backward in the belts. And I thought I was being catapulted through the instrument panel. All sources show the stage is burning perfectly. The third stage fires twice. First, the boost into orbit. The second burn takes the crew of Apollo 8 where no men have ever been. Deep, Deep in the space. Oh, man. How many of you guys remember that? 
I am telling you, I could watch that a thousand times. Ah, you know, it's incredible. That rocket launching off the pad. I mean, oh, gee whiz. Just to be there, I never was there, but people have told me about it. It's unbelievable. It is. It's absolutely mind-blowing to think about it. Over a seven-year period, the Saturn V rocket was launched 13 times, carrying its payload off into space and up onto the moon. Amazing. Amazing. It's 50 years ago today, actually November 5th or 9th, 50 years ago. That was the first launch of the Apollo. Amazing. And you know what's really cool as I look at this and I think about it is how absolutely crazy mind-blowing that is. What Jesus is doing to his disciples is even more so. Because we look at this and we go, whoa, how can that be? And then you look at what Jesus does with these disciples and he is talking about the law with them and he totally takes them to another level of understanding. To a place that they thought, what do you mean? How can we get there? Well, that's impossible. You know, there are people who used to say a phrase. They'd say, oh, I'd rather do that than fly to the moon. And we've flown to the moon. It's amazing. And last night I couldn't sleep. I was out walking. I was so excited about this message. I couldn't sleep. I'm like, oh, I can't sleep back. She goes, well, I can. Get out of here. <laughs> so, so, so I'm walking around, and there's the moon. I've never seen it brighter. I mean, it's absolutely clear last night. And you're looking up at that. I'm going, wow. People flew there. Yikes. And they did it with this three-stage rocket. And what Jesus does with his disciples he teaches them in a three-stage fashion. And I'm going to take you through that in these next couple of weeks. We're going to look at this because as we examine the life of what Jesus is doing with his disciples, specifically in Matthew 5, we are looking at the reality of what these Beatitudes are about. This is the precursor to him doing the full exposition on the law in a way that's going to blow their minds. And in the midst of it, he's also blowing their minds as to what it means to be a disciple. You know, we call them the Beatitudes. It's only because of Jerome, who is a 5th century scholar, who is translating the ancient words into Latin. And Beatitude is Latin. And it basically can be translated as happy. And some of our translations even say that, happy. One scholar said, you know, Ted, that, that really uh, is a disservice to the real word that's there. Because the real word that Jesus is using to those Hebrew boys, obviously written in Greek by Matthew, spoken in Aramaic by Jesus, but has a connection to the ancient Hebraic form and understanding, is more than just something that happy is connected to as an idea of haphazard, happenstance, which has an idea of just being, well, lucky, lucky for us. You know, isn't that a providential thing that happened? You know, well, we're pretty lucky about that. No, it's, it's not that we're lucky or we're fortunate by some chance. What Jesus is saying to these disciples is something far more important and has a connection that they would readily understand because here they are. This is the first time that Jesus has pulled all the disciples together. Now, in Matthew's version of the Bible, he basically just outlines that a couple of the disciples have been identified and then we come right into the Sermon on the Mount. I think it's Matthew's form of writing because in Luke's form, in Luke's account, he has all the disciples already accounted for before he gives a few of the, the Beatitudes. And I think for, for Matthew, he is more focused upon, okay, this is the birth, birth narrative of Jesus. Here's his temptation. He's called some of his disciples. And guess what? His very first thing he does is he sits down. This Matthew is very purposeful about this. Jesus sits down and opens his mouth and begins to teach. This is really critical to understand from a Hebraic understanding. Because when the teacher would sit down, 
That meant we are in formal time right now. We are in a formal instruction. And I am going to instruct you. And Matthew didn't need to say he opened his mouth. That would have been kind of a given, right? But when Matthew does write that, that means that this is a full-on authoritative proclamation that is coming. That's what he's telling the readers who was a Hebraic audience. They knew what was going on here as Matthew's writing to that crowd of Israelites about the gospel narrative of Jesus. Jesus sat down with his disciples. And yeah, there was a whole crowd of people there, but he was focused on those 12. And he began to teach them in an authoritative way. One Orthodox <laughs> scholar put it this way. Imagine yourself as one of those early disciples. You know, you see this guy and you say, oh yeah, he's, he's amazing. You know, he's, he's a man, right? <laughs> that's, that's how you'd understand it. And, they, and, the, and the things that Jesus did, you know, it, it kind of made them go, ow, what? And for us, 2,000 years removed, don't we wrestle and struggle with the teachings that Jesus puts before us? Don't we sit there and go, what? <laughs> and, and sure enough, for these disciples, there they were as they're sitting there, they certainly acknowledged the fact that Jesus was an inspired teacher. There is no question that he spoke with authority. That is identified by everybody. And they even, I think, had questions in their mind. Could this be the Messiah? They really wrestled with this reality, even as some of you may still be wrestling with that reality. What is it to really follow Jesus? What does it mean? You know, here's this guy. Sure, I've seen him around. He walks up. He's, there I am. I'm sitting at my boat. I'm fixing the nets. And he says, hey, come, follow me. I want you to follow me. So I dropped everything, and I came and I followed him. And there I was. I was sitting at my tax, desk, tax collector desk, and, and there's this guy. He comes up to me, Jesus. I hear about him, and yeah, he teaches with authority. I mean, he's amazing. He says, hey, come, follow me. And, yeah, sure, man. I'm closing shop, and I come and follow So I'm following this guy, Jesus. He's a great rabbi. He's an amazing teacher. And then he starts teaching things. And you're like going, whoa, 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 wait, whoa, wait, wait a minute. And he starts saying things to you. It starts to get you to question and wonder, really? Huh? Well, could he be the Messiah? And this Orthodox uh, commentator, great guy, Jim Forrest is his name. He says, you know, you imagine yourself as one of those disciples. And you sit there and you go, wow, you know, how could you really understand everything that he is teaching at that time? Because even those disciples, they didn't get it until after the Pentecost. They really didn't get it until after Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit came and inspired them. For us, 2,000 years removed, we have the advantage, right? We know. And so when we encounter this first instruction where Jesus sits down and opens his mouth and begins to explain to these disciples, all right, I've called you to follow me. This is what it means. This isn't some kind of happenstance. This isn't some kind of chance encounter. It's not happy are you. No. Blessed are you. And see, here's the reality of how we can understand this. Because from a Hebraic understanding of blessing is the reality that this is not something that just comes along and goes. The blessing is a comparative analysis that is readily seen in Psalm 1, right? In Psalm 1, what do they write right there? Right out of the gun, it says, blessed is the man who is, who is uh, focused on God, for he is like a tree planted next to a stream of living waters, right? as opposed to, right, the one who isn't. And so in a lot of ways, how we should understand this word blessed for us, even as we read this and begin this journey of understanding what does it mean to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, it's like the rocket ship. <laughs> it really is. It's the matter of understanding the translation of this as 
because there's no real English word that corresponds with the Hebrew Baruch that we could understand, that we use for this. Is that it's the right trajectory. We are on the right path. We are rooted in the correct place. We are established in a way that equips us to be in relationship with God. Like that tree. We are established into that ground. We are flying like that rocket ship on the right trajectory as opposed to sin being off the mark, going away from, not in concert with what God has designed. So in essence, Jesus is telling his disciples right out of the gun before he unpacks the law, he says, you know, you guys are on the right path. (laughs) You are in the right direction as you're following me and when you come along this line. And so we come. And whether you look at the Beatitudes as eight or nine, eh, here they're there. But I will say this first stage is what I want to look at today. And that first stage puts us here as blessed. Blessed are what? Those who are poor in spirit. Why? Theirs is the kingdom of God. And so, What is Jesus saying right out of the gun? And I think this is really important for us because sometimes we look at these Beatitudes and we go, oh yeah, you know, it's it's a smorgasbord. (laughs) We take this one, we take that one. Oh yeah, I'll attend to this one. Oh, that one? Oh, that's reserved for those religious types like Ted. You know, that's the one he's supposed to live into. Us schmoes down here, we'll take this one over here. This is, you know, this is, a, this is one I can relate to. But yeah, that, that super religious one over there, no, that, that belongs to those guys who are you know, preaching all the time. Sometimes we look at the Beatitudes that way. And sometimes we look at them as over-spiritualized. And we begin to spiritualize these things to a point that they have real no earthly value you know, he said, oh, yeah, it's like this, way up here. No. Sure, they have that spiritual component to them. It's absolutely vital. But there is this terrestrial part to them because Jesus was fully in the flesh and he dealt with world things, you know, and he made it so you could touch it and sense it and experience it. And so likewise with these Beatitudes, they're not a hit and miss smorgasbord. Jesus is purposefully laying out with these disciples. You want to be my follower? Here's step one right here. Step one of stage A. Ready? First thing, poor in spirit. Let's think about that. Poor in spirit. Translation of that word poor is not like, oh, shucks, can't make my gas bill today. You know, ah, poop, I can't go out to dinner tonight. You know, it's not that kind of poor. It's kind of shallow, surface-level poor. No, this is poverty of destitute nature to the fact that you can't even have clothes that you're wearing because you're so out of any contact with anything. You are absolutely destitute. Nothing. That is the word that Jesus uses there, or Matthew uses as he's recording what Jesus says. You are destitute in your spirit. And see, as we understand this, is a recognition that it doesn't matter what we have or what we bring to the table. The things that we have, the material wealth that we have is not going to secure us in a relationship with God. The things that we amass around us have no real value to be able to save us. Matter of fact, The only thing that we have, these things that we have, they're given to us as a gift of stewardship. Everything we have is God's. And when we are able to move ourselves into a posture of being destitute before God, of realizing that our confidence is not in the things that we own, the things that we have, and that we can realize even spiritually that we are destitute before God, it's then that we are taking the very first and necessary step of our discipleship. And as Calvinists, those of us who are Presbyterian, you know, in the Reformed faith, we recognize this because Calvin, John Calvin said we are totally depraved. We have no capacity, none, to affect our salvation. None. That's the first and most important step of discipleship as Jesus is teaching these disciples 
these guys that he just pulled out of the, out of the community. He said, you want to follow me? Okay, great, you're following me. Let me tell you what it's going to be like. This is the first thing. You need to recognize you've got nothing. You bring, you're bringing nothing to the table. And when you realize that, then the kingdom of God is yours. You're making that first step into the kingdom. It's a beautiful thing. And you know what's amazing as we go through these Beatitudes, the next one comes and feeds right off on top of it. I'm going to have to start flying on these things. I spent too much time in the announcements. <laughs> when, when we are ones who see our poverty and our destitute nature before God, what happens next? We understand that we come into a posture of full mourning. Oof. Don't we? If we're honest in our discipleship with Jesus and want to follow this guy with all integrity, not only do we see that we are empty, but then there is this absolute recognition that we need to be in a place asking for forgiveness. A place of regret, right? A place of remorse, a place that puts us on our faces to say, woe is me, like Isaiah wrote, for I am a man of unclean lips. How can I even be in the presence of a holy God? So we mourn, even as Peter mourned after he denied Christ three times and he ran out after the cock crowed and he wept bitter tears. This is where we need to be as well in our discipleship. As we come into a relationship with Jesus, have we fully opened ourselves up? And I say that this first stage of discipleship is all internal. It really is. It's all an internal experience. Everything about it. It's for us, between us and God, and how we are establishing those first couple of steps in that relationship and how we're developing it. First, recognizing that we bring nothing to the table. And secondly, that we fall into a posture of full remorse and mourning. You know, it's when people mourn, that's when they become most transparent. When you mourn, you are transparent, recognizing that, whoa, you know, I am dependent upon others and specifically upon God. If you've never mourned the loss of somebody or never mourned a situation, then you've built a wall that has separated you, even as Simon and Garfunkel sang. I am a rock. I'm an island. A rock feels no pain. But if you want to be honest before a holy God, if you want to be one that reveals the depth of who you are, then you will mourn. And you will seek forgiveness. And the next step, you know, oh, well, this is cool. So when you mourn, <laughs> you will be comforted. This is an assurance that God gives, and this is so true. When we mourn, God comes and says, come, my child, you are mine. And then after we mourn, what's the next step that comes in? And this internal, this internal first initial stage that takes us on the trajectory of a flight path into faithful discipleship for God. And that is being meek. Now, for us in the English language, we like to play the hominin game, right? We sit there and go, well, meek is equal to weak. You know, that's what it is. If I'm meek, then I'm weak. And no. Because in Greek, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and especially in the Hebrew tradition, it certainly doesn't work that way. The hominin doesn't exist. So for us, when we look at this word meekness, it actually has this idea of humility because once we recognize that we bring nothing to the table to secure our relationship with God and we realize that we must fall before the presence of God seeking forgiveness, then all of a sudden we take on a posture of humility. We see ourselves as not the next best thing since sliced bread. We see the, the necessity to be humble. And matter of fact, one person commented on it this way and said, actually this word, as we understand being meek before the presence of God, even as Jesus said, I am meek and humble. Take my yoke upon you. That's how Jesus describes himself, is that there is a strength of character, right? 
that exercises the self-discipline, right, of being gentle. Wow. And the fruit of the Spirit, what? Is gentleness, right? Self-control, right? These are the things that prove to the point that the Holy Spirit is in your life. And when we look at meekness, it's a reality of recognizing that, yes, we are exercising the self-control to express gentleness. Because it's so easy to fly off the handle, right? When somebody ticks you off or gets under your skin or puts a burr under your saddle, oh, man, so pow! <laughs> just... And that's not showing humility at that point at all. <laughs> and we have to. Humility. And you are the ones, what? When you show this meekness, you inherit the earth. Now, that's a curious thing, isn't it? The reality is, think about it. As we live into this expression of humility and self-control that shows gentleness, people appreciate. And more so from a Hebraic understanding is the reality that, you know, to show that humility and to have inheritance, that means you have been given something. You are not adrift in this life. You have something of value that gives you a place to exercise your talents. This is crucial. Humility. How are we fostering that? in our own life of discipleship. That self-discipline of, of gentleness. And then we come to this last one, which I think is really fun. And it is. It's the last, sta- last step in that first stage of the internal journey of your initial walk with Christ. And as we look at these four steps right here, they're kind of in a circular path in some ways because we're constantly working through these things. It's a constant reminder of how we are dependent upon God. It's a constant reminder of how we need to fall before the presence of the Lord asking for forgiveness and and experiencing His comfort in the midst of that. It's a constant reminder for us as we live in our, our, our pursuit of discipleship that we should express a gentleness and a humility of spirit that enables, right, the message of the gospel to go out unhindered. And then we come to this last part. When we step into the world of discipleship, isn't this so true? I mean, it's so cool. I remember when I first became a Christian, and it's unfortunate for us as those of us who have been Christians for a long time, we kind of get fall into complacency. We're like, oh, well, whatever, you know. <laughs> and the thing that's so cool is that when you first step into this journey of discipleship and you see these things that you do. And this is what Jesus is telling these disciples. He said, dudes, if you want to follow me, this is the way it's going to go. And all of a sudden, man, you are going to be famished. I mean, you're going to be starving to death. You're going to hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's what it's going to be. Your discipleship is going to show this because you're going to be like, wow, I want to be in relationship with God. I want to be in relationship. I want to do the right thing. You are hungering for this. Sort of like a baby, you know, when you're in church or whatever, and all of a sudden this baby starts crying. What's it want? It wants food. <laughs> Give me something. You know? And unfortunately for us, our appetites, man, they, they get goofed up as we get older. It's no longer just a demand for food, man. Our appetites get twisted around. To, we want recognition. We want power. We want possessions. We want fame. We want... You know, these things, and none of them, none of them will do this, will satisfy. And this is what's really cool about this first stage of discipleship, is that we start out with recognition that we are destitute, and we have nothing. But you know, when you make that first step, those first four steps of your discipleship, of following Christ and being purposeful about it and hungering and thirsting to do that which is honorable before God, (laughs) you're going to be satisfied. You know? There's an old Asian haiku that uh, 
kind of goes like this. Though the, st- the thief comes and steals all I own, the moon still shines upon my window. And in, be- in essence, it's basically saying, even though somebody may steal all my possessions that I have, and I may be fully destitute, I still have the beauty of life to live. From a Christian standpoint, we recognize that even though all that I have (laughs) and all that I seek to claim to give me identity is nothing, truly nothing, and it all goes away. The reality is I am fully satisfied because my hunger and thirst for righteousness is all that I need. And it gives me the strength to do that which is honorable before God. This is the cool stuff. And boy, I've run out of time. And I'm just going to have to sh- cut it short. So as we look at this, 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 this stage of discipleship for today, and we're going to come back to this after Ryan preaches. So come back for the middle stage. So I'm telling you, you're gonna be, your world will be rocked when you look at the middle stage. But we are on the trajectory, man. We have been launched from the launch pad. The countdown has come. It's rally day. We've come off the pad, and we're heading into seeking to glorify God in our lives as faithful disciples. Friends, let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you that you have laid before us these very simple, simple steps for us to understand as we step into a world of discipleship. Help us again to remind ourselves as we go into our time of personal devotion of how dependent we are upon you and that ultimately that we have this insatiable hunger and thirst for your righteousness and you are the only one that satisfies that. Help us to rest in that meal that you present to us so that we would be ones who walk on the right path. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen.